Okay, just that the people know already that are closely joining and joining now. I see quite a lot of joining still. Uh, we are still waiting until, let me say, we have a certain uh, stability, let me say, in the in the participants that are joining in the moment. We still wait some minutes. There's already one hand raised. Probably um, if you have a hand raised, oh, okay, it's again <laughs> gone. <laughs> Probably just, uh, if you have some questions already now, just please use uh, the chat box or the Q and A box. Great, let's see, hi. Also hi to everybody. <laughs> Okay, I think we closely could start now. I think slowly we raised a certain amount and it's more calm now in terms of participants. Um, okay, then I would like just to start. So welcome to this uh, webinar today. Uh, it's a webinar uh, um, organized by REACT. REACT stands uh, for uh, Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Technology, and it's a technical committee uh, of the IEEE GRSS. My name is Arina Heinzek, and I'm today the host here uh, for this webinar, and uh, I'm a chair of REACT, one of the chairs, and I'm very, very proud and very happy that today uh, we have one guest uh, from one of the topics um, the local focused area topics that we had within REACT, uh, which is dealing with agriculture and food security. And as a guest, we have today here Praveen Pankarayakshan, um, who will talk about uh, his experience, but also uh, the research that they're doing at Cropin IE Lab, uh, which is located in uh, India. So now I'm just uh, heading over to uh, Praveen and um, yeah, probably before I do this, probably just to say, so we will not stop in between for questions. Uh, please, if you have questions uh, in between, as said, please uh, put them into the chat. We try to answer or I try to answer immediately uh, or also at the A&Q chat um, so, or chat boxes. This would be great. Um, afterwards, after the presentation, we will also allow some people, I mean, depending if you do hand raise, if you do hand raise, then we can also allow you to speak up. Uh, this is what we will do. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. And then I just I said, I'm handing over to Praveen. Uh, thank you, Irina. Um, am I audible? Uh... Yes, it works. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for uh, this invitation and uh, especially um, Irina and the React uh, mem uh, committee members as well. Uh, and some of my colleagues uh, there. Um, so um, we have been discussing quite a while for uh, um, actually organizing something on uh, the application of uh, uh, satellite and remote sensing for monitoring food security and uh, you know uh, uh, on, on climate uh, smart agriculture and climate resilient agriculture. Um, so, so today's topic, I just wanted to maybe touch upon a few interesting recent problems that we actually solved. So my name is Praveen Pankajakshan and I lead the Crop and AI Lab. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a mixture of, uh, you know, no one can has the ability of solving uh, such a, a complex and big problem. So where necessary, I've also added some of the collaborators who has worked with me. And uh, so this is a very giant work. Uh, the multiple, you know, moving parts in this. Um, so very briefly, I'll probably talk a little bit about croppings, um, and then I'll quickly switch over uh, my gears to uh, discuss a little bit of uh, the problem statement that we are trying to solve, um, and uh, some interest also to this uh, community on some open problems uh, that might be uh, interesting research work to pursue also, right? Um, uh, so like uh, Kroppen's uh, journey is it's a decade old company. Uh, we still consider ourselves as a small startup. We work very focusedly on uh, small landholding farmers. 
we started with uh, you know like starting with that digital transformation so many of these small landholding farmers don't have um uh, you know like uh, you know their farm lands are not digitized so we started with that basic idea in mind and then we started layering that with different uh, intelligence from multiple different sources both from um, the field data that we're getting and also from our remote sensing data you know um, so we looked at the new geographies. We started from India, but similar geographies like in Asia, Asian subcontinent, uh, Africa, and uh, you know uh, uh, South America. And now we are in Europe and Americas also. You know, um, then uh, the phase three was actually like the nascence of Copenhagen Lab. It uh, happened sometime last year, um, and where you know I created my team and team members which is a mixture of earth observation scientists, data scientists, and agronomists. We have subject matter experts as well. Uh, so it's a triangulation of all the three uh, expertise. Um, and, the, and the other uh, thing that we also uh, recently launched is the agriculture cloud. You know? So I'll not talk a lot about this one. I'll talk mostly about the work that we're doing in the AI lab. Right? So, so we've been uh, providing multiple different solutions, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so some of the solutions can be directly uh, used. Uh, you know, they are data, process data that's available for consumption as API. Some of them are model, some of them are applications. You know, as I said, I don't want to insist or talk uh, a lot on this. Uh, um, you know, and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but we have been actually in uh, more than uh, 13 countries and there are a lot of models which we actually brought to production. So when we talk about models, these are not, these are from incipient stages to, um, you know, uh, partnering with customers, bringing them. And, you know, we have seen like, you know, many of the models that are there in academic, academic uh, um, environment, we have tried to uh, customize and bring them and sometimes they fail, you know, the most important thing is how they work in production environments, you know. <clears throat> um, so there are many of them uh, over, uh, I think now we have over 50 models which work in production remotely. Um, so that's a little bit about cropping, but I'll, I'll just maybe uh, quickly go into the details. But what before I go into that, I also want to um, let you know that <clears throat> this focused area on food security and climate smart agriculture uh, for, you know, what we have planned for this year is also something called the community lab. Um, so as agriculture is a very complex problem, it involves like not only data, models, knowledge coming in. Um, all of that is something that we would like to so and we do have a lot of information and knowledge which we would like to bring and share to the community um so for solving this complex problem i think we need many hands so um with uh, prof sadik Bhattacharya, we thought you know as part of the react we would uh, create this uh, com open community lab which is a learning exercise for sharing data and much more, you know. So uh, maybe at a later point, I'll share more details on this. But those who are interested are welcome to drop me a note uh, on my email address, praveenpankaj at ieee.org. Okay. Um, so a little bit about uh, today's topic, uh, you know, on climate smart agriculture. <clears throat> um, see, uh, agriculture has taken like multiple different uh, revolutions. Okay, and. Uh, the most important thing that, you know, that we are transitioning right now is actually to reduce the net carbon footprint of our agriculture, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, production, uh, food production currently is very, very challenging because the environment that we are growing, it's of uh, the food, is also changing, you know. So, <clears throat> So there are uh, these two problems that uh, face us, right? On one hand, we have to serve the growing population. And so food security is a big issue. At the same time, we have to ensure that and, you know, and the growing challenge of the climate, um, you know, change as well. And the other problem is how do you make, you know, uh, the um, how do you make agriculture sustainable? So in fact, my argument is, and this is also sourced by FAO, is that uh, you know a sustainable production is not only really climate smart, but reduces you know also ensures that it's resilient to climate changes and everything. And I have a hypothesis also for that. Um, I am a uh, you know also a farmer, so and I've tested some of these ideas in my own farm. So I'm happy to be connect uh, 
connecting offline with some of those experiments which I've done. You know? uh, but in today's talk, I want to actually focus on two specific uh, countries, uh, which is Nigeria and Kenya and the Sub-Saharan region. Um, what we want to do is identify, uh, you know, the factors like, you know, the, uh, and basically there are many factors which happen on the ground, but at least using remote sensing, can we actually determine what are the factors and behaviors that, uh, you know, that, that leads farmers to take certain kind of decisions, you know. Um, in, uh, so we took two, uh, actually three uh, crops uh, as study. Um, in Nigeria, we focused on rice and in Kenya, um, and and uh, rice and wheat and in Kenya we focused on maize you know um, and I'll tell you like what are the drivers that you know farmers uh, farmer behavior on cultivation and everything what drives them you know so um, I'll just come into a little bit of the technical details now and then uh, you know combine you see we are trying to combine data sources models and everything from multiple different sources putting together and I'll try to explain the story of what we observe and how that links to actually what's happening in the field and on the ground, right? Um, so, um, so when we, you know, when I talked about the crop and journey, we started with the farm digitization. So we have like, uh, you know, data set. Uh, we have one of the largest data set of uh, crops, uh, growing patterns, seasonalities, you know, sowing, harvesting, um, crop varieties and everything in our database. It's called the Grow uh, application. Uh, so these are all plot geotagged and we use that as information to uh, create signatures of crops, you know. So that's the data set that we use. We also rely on both the optical and uh, radar uh, remote sensing data uh, from um, the European space agencies and also the Landsat data. Um, um, and a little bit of the weather data for long-term normals, climate-related studies, and uh, comparing against the current data and, um, you know, what is available, um, um, you know, uh, current data as against the long-term normals. So when I talk about long-term normals, I'm talking about uh, at least a 20-year and sometimes even a 30-year historical data that I'm comparing against, you know. Um, I'll not go into the details of the model itself, like, but we do have a specific pipeline. The pipeline itself is like um, we have all of the systems running in the cloud. So AWS is our cloud provider. And, um, you know, so for end-to-end -end from satellite uh, data, so what we do is we uh, download the satellite data, then we have like the plot polygons. So we overlay on top of that, clip them process them, uh, make it available as training data set uh, for our models to process and then launch the training data set. Now you can imagine that this is, uh, you know, millions of plots, so we have to parallelize them. So we run this as batch services and then we, uh, you know, uh, get the results from it. We do have also uh, ways of verifying the data. So you often hear me uh, using this terminology called the CCP. It's a very specific term that we use called crop cutting experiments. It's an actual um, exercise that we do. We go to the field. We have a very specific framework for, um, you know, estimating for uh, capturing the, uh, you know, doing the crop cutting and capturing the dry biomass, the wet biomass, which are indicators of what is the possible yield that we can get. And we compare it against our results, right? Um, so I'll not go into the details of this and I'll uh, maybe skip through some of the slides in the interest of time. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about some of the um, open problems that we face, right? Like, um, and, you know, when you talk about it from a computer vision perspective, you know, a um, lot of, uh, in, you know, individuals, um, you know, when they uh, solve problems in remote sensing, they come from, you know, they strictly look at the remote sensing data from uh, like an image and process it like an image, but satellite data is not the same, especially uh, you have to, when you're looking at it from an agriculture perspective, it's very, very different, you know. So I have given, uh, you know, a simulation of how, uh, you know, things look like. Um, you know, from a typical, uh, you know, satellite time series graph, but you can imagine that, uh, uh, you know, throughout the growing season, you're capturing the satellite data, you're acquiring the data and downloading it for different time instances. 
um, right? And then trying to interpret and understand the growing conditions, right? Uh, um, so you can look at it as more like a video frame, but you know the sampling is not non-uniform because sometimes you can have like missed data points. So it's a very very complicated um, you know um, uh, processing uh, approach, right? Uh, but there are some uh, you know tricks and uh, to overcome that. Uh, but just to give you some perspective, right? Imagine that this is a growing uh, season. So what you see in the graph, right? Uh, this is actually across the different uh, agroclimatic zones. So here I've taken India as an example, but uh, we do we can take this in any other um, uh, any other region of the world as well. Um, if each of these regions, so they are actually categorized, they call either agroclimatic zone or agroecological zone, AEZs. You can understand that the growing conditions in all of these are different. The crop which is growing is different. The weather conditions are different. Uh, even the varieties are different. Even between zones like agroecological zones or agroclimatic zones, which are neighboring, uh, there is a, a huge amount of disparity and difference in the variety of the crops itself that are grown, you know. Uh, so it's almost like, you know, you're trying to find a classification problem. That means if you're trying to do a crop identification, there is humongous amount of variation and diversity in the data set itself. Now, you can imagine, so satellite data is time series data is one thing. The other thing is that within a particular growing season, you know, you can imagine that a lot of farmers sometimes, uh, you know, sow the, um, sow it sometimes early in the season, late in the season or during the season, you know. So the sowing date, the harvesting date, everything is variable. As an example here, you know, like what you see in green is the different, you know, farmer sowing date itself. You can see that the maturity itself is like, Depending on the sowing date, the maturity, which is shown in red, can actually also change. You know, so there is drifts which can happen. In fact, time series drifts which can happen, and sometimes added to the complexity is the fact that growing seasons are also shrinking as the temperature heats up. You know, you can see that the growing seasons are shrinking. So it's a very complex problem where your uh, signatures are very diverse you know and it's also it's also evolving you know so there is a time drift which can also happen you know just to give you some understanding right um, this is a very sample example that i took from the training data set just to give you an idea for example we already have like uh, some idea that uh, one particular plot is growing chickpea another plot is growing maize you know um, and what you see here is, let's say, days after sowing. So this is the sowing, with sowing, and this is approximately harvesting. You know, um, you can see that uh, if you look at it from a machine learning perspective, if you take this as the input data, you have what we have uh, in green and orange is a uh, respectively the validation and the training data set. So orange is a training data set, and green is the validation data set. But now, if you go to a new region. You know, the chickpea signature, you know, is very different, you know. Uh, so I've taken this from two different, very, very different agroecological uh, zones. Um, you know, the col my collaborators, Nerzari and Nikhil, um, are the ones who are trying this out. Uh, you can see that there is already like drift between the training and the, um, uh, you know, the test data set. It's not uh, this case only for chickpea, maize, paddy, you know, you take any of them. Uh, you know, there are slight shifts, there are slight changes in the intensities and things like that, right? So these are all complex problems. Like now, uh, just to give you an idea of the drift, what I've done here, I've taken the entire, uh, you know, satellite data, downloaded it. I know that these are paddy clusters. The others, uh, you know, there are also like, there are paddies in them. There is maize, there is uh, a wheat and you know it's a mixture of multiple different crops so that's a training data set and i've projected it onto this two dimensional uh, u map projection after like uh, reducing the dimension and what you see here interestingly what is only labeled uh, is uh, you know the paddy um, in orange is a cluster um, you can see the time series graph how it looks like you know so you can imagine that this is actually an image right like uh, this because it's a multi-spectral data, you have both optical data and also the uh, radar data. So they are all grouped together. And this is a time series of these grouping. And then we are like, we have actually like 
uh, done a dimensionality reduction and projected it and into this U map. And you're looking at, because these are labeled data sets, so you're looking at why Paddy is actually like appearing in three different regions, you know? So you can see that because like, um, you know, uh, the previous season's harvest is not yet completed and it's coming into the cycle. And then the next season also is there. So, you know, and some people decide to leave it uh, barren, right? Or uh, some farmers decide to grow a shorter duration crop just after paddy, you know? So these are very, very different scenarios that can happen, you know? So all of this also have to be taken care of while in training, you know? Um, so that's to just to give you an idea of the complexity. Now we'll come to how we do it, right? So the first important point is to kind of like clean away with, uh, even when we are doing inferencing, is actually like to clean away with a lot of these uh, noises uh, and things that, you know, and which can actually interfere with our classification. So the first thing that we do is the land use, land classification. But when people talk about land use and land classification, they are talking about only like detecting agriculture versus urban and everything. Now, you know, the agricultural layer itself is very, very dynamic, you know, so it's changing all the time. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's not like as if like, you know, you've decided that this is an agriculture layer, so it's a static map. You can imagine that the previous season, um, uh, previous uh, season is not yet harvested, it's coming into this season, or the this season has started early, you know, so the dynamic is humongous, you know, and so, um, so what we do is that we actually like account for all those kind of, uh, so within agriculture classes itself, we have 13 different subclasses on how actually the agricultural, um, you know, a mask could be generated from this, uh, you know, the satellite data, right? Uh, we do an active learning. That means we, uh, you know, train uh, and then generate the labels. And then we use actually the human in the loop to uh, kind of refilter them and retrain the model, you know? And so we generate something called as active vegetation cover. This is primarily very important. And then on top of it, we have the crop identification layer, right? Um, so once the, uh, you know, as I said, like this is, you know, just to give you an idea of what different kinds of time series graphs of, uh, you know, the agricultural, uh, you know, dynamic area itself can be mapped. So once we find out what's the active uh, crop area right now in this particular season, then on top of it, we uh, try to overlay and identify what's the crop of interest, right? So <clears throat> I'll go into the next uh, topic. How do we identify crop uh, mass? You know, so this is a joint work which we did with Avik, uh, Professor Avik Bhattacharya from IIT Bombay, who is also part of React. Um, so, uh, you know, like Paddy, for example, exhibits specific uh, phenological characteristics. So this is, uh, you know, kind of like how we embed knowledge into our um, into also um, uh, phenological knowledges into how we classify and identify crops. Uh, but, you know, I'll not go into the details of it, but uh, most of the paddy that's growing in the world is flooded paddy. So they exhibit specific signatures in the uh, radar Sentinel-1 data. So that's what we use for detection. Um, and once this is done, you know, like, uh, so this is a very nice example where, uh, you know, we can actually identify how much of, you know, of in a particular region, how much of sowing progression has happened. Uh, what you see in the blue graph, you know, is that we have identified, you know, these agricultural growing pixels, you know, and each pixel might be uh, dependent on how much, you know, it's the spatial resolution that you have of the agricultural of the satellite data. Now, what you see here is that, uh, you know, the, um, uh, for example, this is 21st of September, 2022. So some, the sowing has already started, you know, and, you know, the peak of the sowing for this particular season is almost on the 20th of November. And then it kind of like decreases and it reduces to, you know, 30th of December. So you see all this period of time, the farmers can actually sow. So it's almost like a three month time window for this particular crops to be grown within a particular growing season, you know, and the more diverse the crops are, the more, uh, you know, the wider uh, this uh, graph is, you know, but you can see that by the time it's about, uh, you know, the 30th of December, almost all the crops has been sown, right? So this is the cumulative sowing. 
You can, we can also do a cumulative harvest, something similar also we can do. This is for a different region, uh, is that, but it's much more, uh, you know, a skewed curve. That means harvesting almost happens very, very quickly. Um, so uh, while sowing can be diverse because of the crops that you're doing, um, most often, like because of the next season coming in, most farmers try to do the harvesting very, very quickly. So you see that, uh, you know, the peak and the cumulative harvest uh, is almost like matching. Um, and by 8th of February, almost most of the harvest is done, right? Um, so you can do these kind of insights as well and try to find out. So what we found from this kind of analysis is that sometimes farmers wait for uh, the, <clears throat> the season's uh, rainfall to start. So they're waiting for sowing. So we see that they are delaying, delaying, delaying. Or sometimes like, you know, the first rainfall comes and even it's before the season and some people, some farmers actually sow it early. So we see, you know, um, these two extremities and everything in between, right? So sowing patterns, so the previous slide, sorry, I'll go back to this. This, what I'm trying to express is as the climate changes, the sowing pattern is also changing. Now, what we have also seen is the harvesting also Earlier, it used to be a longer you know, um, crop cycle, but these days we are seeing shrinkage of crop cycles. The reason is uh, farmers are doing early harvest because the crops are maturing uh, very early because the amount of heat units which they accumulate is suddenly increased. You know? That means they mature really, really fast. You know? um, so the seasons are shrinking, the time duration between seasons are also shrinking, so farmers have to really prepare their lands very quickly and everything. So there are some lot of challenges also associated with that, right? So once we identify what are the areas that are, um, you know, or uh, agriculture areas, um, you know, so that we, you know, the active vegetation, we need to active crop mask, we need to detect, and then we actually deploy one of our deep learning model, which is actually pre-trained on some of the, many of the data samples that we have. And we see like, what are the crops of interest that we can detect, you know? Um, I'll not go into the details of it, but there are a lot of uh, methodologies. There are some recent methodologies also on, uh, you know, like doing an unsupervised uh, <clears throat> methodology as well. So this is a supervised methodology that we did. Uh, but we have also deployed in certain geographies where there is minimal amount of data samples that are there. We have also done some unsupervised methodology. Uh, this is a very, very interesting and growing area. Uh, I think like a lot of uh, interest in this, can we actually try to do minimal uh, zero shot learning? Um, I think there's definite applications of that and domain adaptation techniques. Uh, out of distribution classification and things like that. So these are really open problems, which I can open it up to this research community as well. Um, um, and uh, the, the emerging areas is like, how do I actually have use only the satellite data? Can I use some pre-trained model, but pre-trained in a um, kind of like self-supervised way? And then break that off. And then with minimal amount of label samples, um, can I actually now deploy it, um, you know, in a large, a large uh, scale inferencing um, uh, in a region of interest, right? So <clears throat> these are all very, very uh, recent and interesting ideas. What we have done is we trained a large model for, uh, you know, certain regions, and then we transfer learned it. Uh, so you have, wherever we go, we find always some minimum data samples. So we can always like fine tune our models. Um, again, I'll not go into the details of this. Um, so once the crop identification is done, uh, the next challenge is estimating the yield, you know? So uh, in this particular yield estimation approach, what we have found is that the yield estimation is kind of like a, um uh is uh is physics in, inspired so it's it's a it's not only really like data driven but a combination of data driven and physics based model um the the um the, the fundamental basis of it is that uh, you know the way that uh, a crop actually um, you know responds uh, and the uh, the yield of, of it is dependent on we say that it's dependent on three factors right the genetics, the environment, and how the farmer manages the field, okay? 
Now, obviously, like from a remote sensing perspective, it's very difficult to know the genetics of a crop, right? Um, so we have some general idea. So within a particular region, we know actually like what's the potential that a particular crop can reach to, right? Uh, but we can never know like the gene, uh, you know, the genomic, we can never do the genomic analysis of every single crop, right? Um, but we can actually study the effect that these crops have um, during the growing season using remote sensing. We can actually study the effect of weather and climatic conditions, the available water, and how the crop is responding to it. And that we use, is, use it as a basis um, along with certain crop related parameters to estimate the yield. You know, so um, so these are like there are some crop specific uh, dynamic coefficients which we actually can calculate from uh, either from ground truth data or from prior some historical data or from scientifically uh, you know like um, validated data set from public domain and then we actually calculate the yield. <clears throat> okay. Um, we also have a very intelligent way of sampling and getting ground truth data as well. Um, so we follow something called stratified sampling. So given uh, you know a set of uh, satellite data and weather data, we kind of stack them together. And then we try to find out what are those regions which are homogeneous and what are the regions which are heterogeneous. Those regions which are homogeneous, you know, we kind of like only take few data samples those which are actually very heterogeneous, we try to take more data samples there, you know. So um, so we, we do this kind of like uneven sampling. And then uh, based on that, we compare, you know, the results that we get uh, with this ground data. Obviously, we can't cover or uh, take a lot of ground data. So we are very careful about that, you know. So this is how it actually looks on field, you know, like it's it's a very, very uh, you know, manual process of data collection. So you go to the field, you demarcate regions, you take per permission of the farmer and everything, uh, and you compensate for their losses in this particular area. So you actually like demarcate a region of interest, and then you do actual crop cutting. So you you uh, weigh the biomass, you weigh the, if there are any, uh, you know, like uh, fruiting that has happened, you weigh that. So you weigh both the wet biomass and the dry biomass. So you actually like keep it out for drying. And after a few days, you come back and weigh that also, you know. So, so these are all field values. Uh, these are all field photographs, this is, uh, which I have shared. Um, and this is how we validate. So not only in, uh, in India, but we do it in uh, this uh, region of interest that I was talking about. <clears throat> so... Uh, coming back to this, uh, I have only like maybe like another seven minutes or so. Um, so I'll, in that I'll cover. So at, until now, I was talking about crop methodology and, uh, you know, crop identification, land use, land classification of agri layer, how we dynamically estimate the agriculture area. We identify the crop area and uh, crops that are growing and also the yield. What I want to now focus on is these two regions that we talked about, right? Uh, um, uh, Nigeria and Kenya. Um, so we took both the wet and the dry season in uh, Nigeria and in Kenya we took the long rain and the short rain season. But I'm going to only uh, talk about wet season uh, because it will, you know, extend, uh, you know, the analysis can be extended also to the, uh, to the shots, uh, to the dry season and also the short rain um, in Kenya. Uh, but what we found is we took a base year, like 2017 as a base year, and we looked at 2023 as a base year. What we found is based on all this analysis on, we can identify the crop acreages, for example, this is for paddy, I talked a little bit about paddy and their phenological stages and estimation and everything. Uh, we found that there is almost like 11 percentage drop in uh, crop yield in comparison to the 2017 data. You know, we are comparing it against the long-term averages. Uh, so that's a, you know, like huge drop for, um, you know, a country and this is over a period of time, right? Like, so we did the analysis only for two years, but we have the ability of doing it for longer duration as well. We even found the crop conditions and production quite below normal. Um, and the, there are some causative factors for it. Uh, one, one thing is, in, for example, in the 2023, we found that the onset of season itself was delayed, you know, like, uh, which means that, you know, when the farmers saw that the onset of the season is delayed, they probably hesitate to actually like sow something like paddy, which is 
uh, you know, which is water consuming, right? Like then they're hesitant because they are like unsure about the rainfall, right? And if they are only, if it's a rain fed crop and they don't have irrigation su support, then they kind of like hesitate. So the drop in production and the drop in acreages could be attributed to that, right? <clears throat> um, this is for Kenya, for example, for the long grain. And similarly, we found that uh, this, uh, you know, uh, was the crop conditions and the productions was below normal not because of uh, only because of uh, reductions rainfall but we also found that the climatic effect has an effect on the uh, you know the ground conditions uh, effect of stress especially the pest and disease stresses you know during this particular season we found that there was a lot of uh, you know uh, reports coming from the field on fall army worms you know so uh, the drop in production could be attributed to that um, and there was also some, uh, you know, drought outbreaks also. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. The regions which we focused on is majorly like maize producing regions in Kenya. What you see in the left side is, uh, you know, the um, um, arid semi-arid semi map of Kenya, like mapped, uh, you know, into regions which are like really uh, emergency conditions versus those which are actually like stressed and minimally stressed. What we found from our long-term normal analysis of precipitation for the 2023, which was last year, is that we found that many of these regions exhibit high droughts-related stress, you know, like because of um, loss in precipitation, you know. So what you see here in red is the precipitation anomaly compared against the uh, long-term normal. So some of these regions, which are like West Pokot, Baringo, and Lakipia, excuse me, uh, which are high maize producing regions have been very highly stressed because of rainfall. So, um, so this could be one actually factor. <clears throat> okay, I do have some, um, you know, like um, HTML, uh, some, uh, you know, production maps also, but I, I don't know if I have some time. But what we found is, uh, if you look at, for example, um, this region, right, Mandara region, we found that um, this was already, you know, exhibiting uh, very high stress, drought-related stress, because uh, people in this region have to depend on uh, the neighboring countries for their water. Um, what we found is that in comparison to 2018, in 2023, um, you know, the farmers actually like migrated into new areas, you know. Now, uh, this number of uh, what you see in red is the amount of acres uh, or hectares of land which is under maize production. Um, green represents highly uh, um, more number of acres under maize, hectares under maize production. Um, orange is uh, medium and red is uh, very less, you know. Uh, these regions are maize producing regions, but because of drought stresses, you know, like you can see that people have now migrated to new regions, you know, and um, um, not only that, like the major uh, maize producing regions, which is worse in Gishu, the production almost dropped by uh, nine to 10 percentage in these regions, you know. Um, I have uh, a few more statistics, which are very, very interesting statistics as well. Um, what we see is now I took a difference between 2018 data and 2023 data, um, you know, so what you see on the left side, black areas is where in 2018 maize used to grow. Like if you look at some of these regions, which are major maize producing regions, now you see that they're all black. That means the uh, those hectares have now disappeared, you know. You see that green is the new areas which where now maize is growing. You know, I talked a little bit about Mandara County where people move from here to this region, right? So now the interesting thing is Nakuru region, um, you know, this region, you see that it's already black, you know, but this region was actually very high yield uh, producing region. So you see this map here, this is green. This is a very high yielding region. So more than 2.37 tons per hectare of, um, you know, of, uh, uh, of yield that you can get here. And here farmers have actually stopped growing. Now, uh, what we also see is like, uh, there are some new areas which has emerged, like for example here, uh, earlier we didn't actually see maize growing in these regions, but you see that these are in red. That means new regions where farmers are growing 
uh, they're not actually getting good yield either. You know, so earlier high yielding uh, regions have been becoming, you know, have been uh, disappearing uh, and new regions are appearing, but they are not necessarily, uh, you know, high yielding regions, you know, so so these are things which we are uh, trying to investigate what could be the causative factors, you know. Uh, one of the things that we did is SPEI analysis, which is, uh, you know, uh, precipitation, standard precipitation and evapotranspiration index, which is used for drought studies. Uh, what we did find in Nakuru and even in Kakamega is that the 30 percentage reduction between 2023 and 2018 could be attributed due to poor rainfall. So if you look at uh, this graph here, this is accumulative rainfall, uh, and this is for 2023 in purple. Um, as against, like, for example, 2020, what you see in orange was a good year, you know, in 2019 and 2020, you know, so it was a much more of a wet year, right? So this extreme drought-like conditions in Nakuru, along with a few other causes, you know, like even lack of uh, support, has actually forced farmers to stop uh, producing maize in these regions, you know. So there are some news articles also, like, uh, which are kind of supporting. In fact, 15% was in 2022, and now uh, in 2023, it's even more decreased, you know, by almost by 30%, you know. So uh, this is also confirming what we are seeing, like, you know, Mandara, for example, uh, earlier uh, residents, they are moving to new regions, you know, in search of water, and which has also led to loss in production. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, I lost my... Um, okay. Uh, so these are interesting insights that are coming. Not only that maize is very, very sensitive to changes in uh, in temperature, you know, especially during the growing season when actually, in, like any crop, if there is any stress, what happens is the crop actually, like instead of producing its fruit, uh, you know, or vegetable, it kind of like, or, or, or rains, it kind of goes into a stress mode. So it kind of like, enlarges its root systems looking for water or it goes into a kind of like hibernation stage conserving its water right um, so all of these use cases are possible during different phenological stages so flowering can be lower or if the flowering has happened pollination and fruiting or grain filling can be affected you know but what we see is that in Kakamega County, for example, uh, there was, uh, it is a major maize producing region. There was about 1.5 degree increase in, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the temperature during the growing season and yield has also dropped in this region, you know. Uh, so you can see this blue areas, you know, wherever there is red, you can see the corresponding drop in yield is also very, very significant. You know, um, so um, yeah, so that's one interesting idea. So sorry, the blue is the temperature and the red is the drop in the yield, you know. Uh, so blue represents one to 1.5 degrees drop, uh, increase in temperature, while the red represents a drop in yield, you know. Um, so one other last story, and I'll just stop here. I think I'm almost running out of time. Um, and this is on in Nigeria, you know, that we did, uh, we dig the paddy, but we also did, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, wheat uh, in, in, paddy, in, uh, in Nigeria as well. Uh, we did for 13 um, L, uh, states in, in Nigeria. Um, and in this, like, uh, so these are the different uh, states and, you know, this is a color coding of the different eels. Um, and also we verified the, uh, our yield values with actual uh, field data. Now, there is something very, very interesting that happened, you know, is that um, what we, so this is the predicted versus actual yield, you know, like, so uh, the error rates of ours is very less. But um, what happened is the wheat production, uh, we were looking at, for example, Borno in wheat. Borno is one of the largest wheat producing state in normally in, uh, in Nigeria. Now, what we saw is that Borno, for this particular year, there was a huge drop in production. You know, this was actually very, very concerning for me because I thought that the, somehow there was a model drift um, and that it was not performing for this particular state. But what we found is that, in fact, after verification, initially there was some, um, you know, uh, differences that this 
could not be actually possible. Then when we went and did the ground verification, in fact, this particular region was especially affected by insurgency. So many of the farmers earlier who were actually uh, wheat uh, producing farmers actually had migrated because of uh, socio-economical stresses, you know, and socio-political stresses. So, so this was also one interesting study. Um, there are also other applications to Asia and the world. Uh, so we have run this across um, different countries and we have verified the yield error metrics and everything. This is one work that we did in um, for paddy cultivation in the US. So it's not just showing that, uh, you know, p uh, soil moisture in Glen County in US, for example, farmers, rice farmers are kind of like not growing, deciding to not grow actually because of, uh, you know, water related stress. Um, you can see that this was actually an earlier rice growing farm in 2022. Actually, the farmer decided not to grow. And there is almost 63 percentage drop in production in, in rice in, in the Glen County in US, you know. Uh, we also did this for India, like, for example, we found some interesting, um, you know, analysis is that when we did the long term, um, you know, temperature and we when we compared, this is in last year, February, uh, we had like in Feb, both in February and July, uh, this uh, Asian subcontinent especially heated up. What we found is that the, um, the maximum temperature and even the mean temperature was about four to five degrees above the long-term normals, you know, and even the uh, you know the night temperatures also was very high. So the the plants and the crops didn't have time to even recover from, uh, you know, the daytime stresses, you know. So the, the diurnal temperatures actually the difference between the uh, the day and the night was also reduced. This particular period of time, what we found is that potato growers were especially affected and. Um, you know, then uh, we found that, uh, you know, farmers having heat necrosis, you know, so the plant is really like, you know, the tuber farming, everything has happened. But then when the farmer pulls out the plant and below, we see that the tuber is having heat necrosis. Even wheat farmers were severely affected because of this, you know. So there was not only like the global war that was happening, which reduced, uh, you know, the wheat production uh, available for the world. Uh, but also these kind of climate related stresses was also affecting wheat, uh, uh, sunflower, mustard. So all these prices, food commodities also kind of like increase, you know, so this is showing, uh, you know, what I talked about, you know, we observed wheat and mustard like re reducing by 20 percentage, leading to oil stresses in oil uh, across the globe, you know, uh, India's ability to export also fell, you know, uh, in many of these uh, uh, regions. We also studied precipitation related anomalies in one particular region in India. We suddenly saw that in Siddipet that it was actually severely, um, yield was severely affected. And that's because we had like continuous rain and hailstorm. So these kind of studies are also possible, you know. So I'll stop here. I think like that's my last slide. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, I'll be now happy to, take in any questions. Uh, I know that this was quite intense, you know, because there's a lot of work that has happened. Um, but if you have uh, any specific questions, you can always write to me on, uh, you know, also Praveen Pankaj at IEEE.org. And this is my QR code for connecting uh, through, uh, through the LinkedIn platform. Um, and if you have uh, any questions, then I'll be happy to address that. Uh, you know, in the next few minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot, Praveen. It, uh, it was a really very rich, let me say, <laughs> uh, presentation yeah. with a lot of uh, things ongoing. Um, and you see also, I, I think really, it's, it's really impressive to see how much work has been also done. Uh, this is also associated to a lot of questions. So we received really a lot of questions. So I'm not sure if we have enough time to answer all of them. Uh, but if you like, we can just start now to uh, read out some of them so that you could answer them already now. So let us start a little bit, um, um, let me say, with the first ones. For example, mm -hmm. I start now with the chat. So we have a chat and F F a, um, Q and A, uh, let me say, um, question. But from the chat, um, here one of the 
the first one uh, was asking, I'm wondering in case of flooded rice, how remote sensing data could be leveraged for detection of irrigated versus rain fed rice? Is there any way to identify rice areas only? Okay, yeah. That's a great question. Um, so it's actually like what we do is we don't look at uh, only at, uh, how do you say, um, uh, only at the radar remote sensing data. Like we also look at, uh, for example, weather, precipitation. Precipitation gives also a very good idea, like whether, uh, you know, in, especially in regions where uh, we have like minimal amount of rainfall and you still see the, uh, you know, the regions, these regions flooded, it gives an idea that there is some amount of irrigation that is happening, uh, some support for irrigation canals and things like that which are available. Um, but it's it's one of the open problem on how do we actually just use remote sensing alone. Uh, if that's the question, I think it's a little bit uh, challenging to just detect uh, irrigated versus rain fed. But you can use some uh, supplementary auxiliary data like weather to actually uh, get that idea, right? Uh, especially when, uh, you know, in the absence of like our minimal amount of precipitation, then you can actually see that uh, it's ground, uh, you know, data, ground uh, water that is being used for uh, feeding the rice, right? Like, so for flooding the rice. So mm -hmm. um, I think there is one more on, uh, on so on uh, um, rice, if I can just uh, combine yeah, that. Like, uh, okay. Yeah, so the, uh, these, there are so very specific, I think rice is one of the most, you know, like uh, uh, I would say, a uh, simpler crop to detect if it is flooded rice. So there is some already uh, work that we have, um, you know, uh, that we have done with Professor Vik Patacharya. And these signatures are like very, so when the flooding happens, we can see that, uh, you know, the signature uh, are very unique as against when it actually starts growing. You can see that the difference between that is uh, between the flooded versus when the uh, you know, the, the the crop cannot be gross and when it has reached in maturity, that is very, very significant and very easy to detect, you know. So um, so I think that can actually be uh, used as a, uh, and there are a lot of articles on it. If, uh, if, uh, if you write to me, I can actually share that, uh, you know, those articles also with you. Um, the other question is, um, uh, on, I think I heard, I saw somewhere on forest also. <clears throat> um, so yes, actually we do. Um, so that's one of the thing is we first remove in our, uh, in, your, in our detection of agriculture area, it's very important not only to detect forest um, and forest versus shrublands versus croplands versus grasslands, you know, so sometimes even shrubs and um, grasses can be con confused with uh, with cropland. So that's an open problem, if I may say so. Uh, how do you actually use, uh, you know, a readily available radar or optical data to kind of make that difference? Uh, that's why we use actually this, uh, um, you know, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, human in the loop and active learning. So that's where we actually correct and give it. Now, not only that, um, I have an interesting problem as well, which is, uh, you know, how do you also uh, detect not only forest areas, but plantation, right? Like, for example, many of you know that UDR is, uh, uh, you know, the uh, direction for um, what kind of crops can actually, what kind of produce can come into European Union is now being monitored closely. So in that, there is like, you know, uh, you can also have like what are, those regions of the world which are producing uh, agricultural uh, uh, crops uh, as after uh, deforestation, you know. So um, I think that's an interesting problem also to look at, like uh, if we can use these LULC maps to detect deforested areas and also, you know, uh, uh, be compliant with the recent EUDR policies. Um, yeah, and uh, is it okay if I go through some of them? Uh, yes, yes. So uh, otherwise I can help you to read them if you like. <laughs> okay. But I think uh, sure. um, 
yeah so i we i think we can still do some of them and then probably we need to stop right <laughs> yes, but yeah. uh, but people can still write you an email i would say uh, because there are so many requests so it's amazing that so much um, interest is there which which is good i really like it but probably yeah. you, you just go forward with some of the questions if you like yeah um so there is one question it is like all the results are not kenya and nigeria um i mean I, it like i think this was before i showed probably for nigeria so i taken kenya as an example but we do have also the same thing paddy uh, model which was run on nigeria as well and we do uh, we do get a lot of interesting insights from that also uh, but last uh, you know few slides before i showed something for uh, wheat as well um so that's i think probably that answers your question uh, which deep learning model were used? So, uh, so this is like, uh, you know, uh, we tried out multiple different uh, models. So uh, this is actually like custom trained on the data set. So it uses a very specific architecture. Uh, if you would like, I can actually like go into the details of it also. Please write to me and I'll be happy to share that. Uh, in tropical areas, oh, okay, sorry, I missed... Uh, uh, one question, uh, how stress factors were calculated? So many red pixels. Um, yeah, so maybe if uh, if there is a, a discussion on yield, so the yield uh, stress, that means we have just, uh, that's a good question. In fact, I forgot to address it. So if it is related to, uh, you know, crop acreage loss or yield loss, how we do it is we kind of bucket them, you know, so uh, we bucket them into multiple different colors, and depending on um, and de depending on the acreages, like you know, which we estimate, we have actually categorized them as like you know, high acreage areas, medium acreage areas, low acreage areas. So that's how we bucket them, and the yield is also similarly. You know, we have some buckets above a certain threshold. We consider that as a very high yield uh, region. And so we uh, find that out. Um, if we are look, if you're talking about stresses particularly, like we estimate, for example, the uh, weather-related stresses, environment-related stresses. So as I said, we look at long-term normals, climate long-term normals uh, for any region, and we see like how the current season is performing against that, and then we bucket them. Right again, uh, we distribute them as very highly. If there is really a huge amount of anomaly, so that's a highly anomalous region as against medium and low, right? So that's how we bucket them. And so, uh, you know, so um, in tropical, I hope that addresses the question. In tropical area, Sentinel-2 data have gaps. How did you uh, gap fill the data for rice paddy to capture each one? That's a good question as well. I think it's one of the open problems we do uh, for... Uh, tropical areas when there is, uh, we do have a cloud, um, you know, filling data generation of cloud free data. Um, you know, it depends on whether it's at regional level or plot level. Uh, it's not perfect. Like, I mean, if there is, for example, what you have observed is at the beginning of the season, if there is a lot of cloud, then it becomes difficult, uh, you know, to kind of fill the gaps. Um, but if, if only a few data, few uh, satellite data is missing, then it's more, much more reliable and much more stable to fill it up. If you know actually the crop which is growing and at plot level, actually it's much more, we have also done it for certain potato farmers. It's much more uh, you know, simpler to do that because we can look at the uh, crop phenology and everything and you know the amount of the stage, phenological stage in which the crop in and kind of use that knowledge to also uh, find out uh, how the crop is doing, you know? So what what is responsible for low wheat yield in these two regions, whether there, whereas the neighboring state of Kabi shows relatively high yields? I'm not sure exactly, like I've not uh, delved into that uh, detail, uh, but what we have seen is, uh, you know, like sometimes it could be because of uh, lack of availability of uh, inputs, you know, so sometimes like certain regions, they might have more accessible to fertilizers. That's what we have seen, but I, I don't know, we have not done the analysis for this, but two particular states. Uh, what we did is especially the concerning areas was for Borno, um, and that's where we actually did, uh, you know, the analysis for, for Nigeria. Um, 
I if you think I try just, to add yeah, if you scroll questions. down, there's still two questions on the chat. If you just scroll down, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, does it have predictive analytics of weather conditions so that Indian farmers can decide the crop accordingly? Uh, we uh, so I don't actually uh, develop models for weather predictions. I use models. I think that's a, a beyond my expertise, but it is indeed a challenging problem. Uh, but we do have like forecasting data, which is available. Uh, what I've usually seen is most of the, uh, you know, reanalysis data is very accurate, but the forecasting data uh, one week uh, is quite okay. Beyond one week, I think it's still a challenge. Uh, it's an open problem again, uh, you know, like for example, precipitation. Uh, if we can actually predict it, my wish list would be one month down the line, we could predict it. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, at least for sowing, I think the most important thing is like start of sowing. I think that's an important thing. And uh, Indian farmers do have access to the start of the season, you know, so there is a lot of advice that goes on, uh, goes through. What we do is we channelize our uh, analytics, our systems and everything through the governments. Uh, and the governments provide, uh, share the information to the farmers, you know, so we work with the governments. We or development agencies, you know. Um, uh, and there's, an, I think the last question is, would you share us a demo uh, if it's possible? So the, just to answer in principle this, uh, it's recorded. So the webinar is recorded and you can uh, look to it, but I don't know about the demo. Probably it's meant also the demo on the agriculture. Uh, I'm not sure if you I can answer this. Yes, I do have a demo. Let me just uh, open it up. Uh, um, so if I just uh, click on this, um, so let me just, I hope uh, this works. Uh, I hope the server works. Um, yeah, Still it's just loading. loading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, probably we can also go then uh, to the other part, which is uh, Q and A. Oh, okay, it's coming now. Sorry. Yeah, so this is like, uh, so each of uh, this region, so I, I'll just maybe focus on this major wheat producing area. So uh, we have taken our analysis and we have actually, <laughs> uh, you know, given this at a five kilometer by five kilometer grid. So what you see in green is actually areas which have high acreage, orange, uh, amber is, uh, you know, medium producing medium acreage region and red is, uh, you know, uh, low acreage region. So each, uh, you know, point each uh, in this, you can actually zoom in uh, and you can see that each of this actually has uh, also a tooltip where there is a, we have given a grid ID, we have the year in which we have processed it and how the different, uh, you know, the yield looks like, what's the total agricultural area, what is the total grid area versus how much of it is under agriculture, how much of it is under maize. So I'll just read it out for you. So this total, for this particular grid, the total area is about 1,670 acres under agriculture, out, un, sorry, total acres, uh, hectares, uh, but in that uh, about 490 hectares is agricultural crop, agri growing this particular season. Out of that maize is 373 uh, hectares, and the yield that we find average here is about uh, three tons per hectare, you know. And here we found that the crop health was below normal. The temperature, we didn't find any anomalies here, you know. So you can see that, for example, in these areas, which was uh, where the crop acreage is low, but also yield is low, you see that, I don't know if you're able to see it, uh, maybe I'll just read it out for you. The last one is precipitation anomaly. So in this, for example, the the rainfall was below normal, you know, so that could possibly explain one of the reasons why the yield is low, you know. Um, so we can do this slice and dice this data, like we are also having it for 2018. Uh, this is for 2023. So we can do comparison against multiple different years and see like how the, uh, you know, crop growing patterns are shifting and everything, you know, so, yeah. Um, I do have also for uh, another region as well, like, uh, you know, for example, this one, I can open this as well. I don't know if we have enough time, maybe we all the overshot on time. Uh, but this is like, you know, to get, give you an idea, like 
for example, this is Nakuru, what a region I was talking about. This is a high yielding region, but we have actually lost maize acreages here. You know, there are some new areas where farmers are growing. Um, and you can see that these are new areas, but the yield is still very low. You know, sorry, there is no tooltip here. Uh, but uh, for example, here it's less than one ton per hectare. So farmers are moving to new regions, probably looking for water or looking for other, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're getting some support, uh, but it's not necessarily leading to higher production. So overall production in Kenya kind of like reduces, you know, so uh, we do have like more data, but in the interest of time, I think I'll probably stop the demo here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can still go now to the uh, Q&A questions. I'm yeah. not sure if you can open this. Uh, for example, the first one is asking what factors were considered to identify the agroclimatic zones? Oh, okay, that's a great question. Um, so that, that's, um, you know, actually these are uh, clearly defined, like for example, for India and other regions, it's actually like defined already. But it's possible, uh, you know, now if you can actually do, um, you know, uh, different uh, weather data and you can, uh, you know, look at um, long term climatic conditions, then you can actually divide uh, these regions and cluster them separately and group uh, uh, them uh, together based on um, based on similar climatic conditions. What we actually see is there is one interesting uh, you know, a uh, thing that came out, one particular group of farmers, you know, came to us saying that, can you find out new regions because our current potato growing region is no longer supporting us. So can you, uh, you know, now look at new regions where we can grow, right? So so the idea of that agroecological zone and agroclimatic zone earlier division, I think in a few years, probably we'd have to do a, a map remapping of that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's also an emerging area. So it, I don't think it, now it's static, but I think I hope in a few years it will actually. I mean, I think we should start, you know, remapping that. Um, okay, and there's another question. Um, sh should I read it? So I would like to ask how the researcher generate the farm plot boundaries for Nigeria and if the data is for the whole of Gen Nigeria or a specific zone in Nigeria. Also, I'm aware that some farms have mixed cropping and irregular crop patterns in Nigeria, especially when there is disasters like flooding. How does the researcher manage this situation in developing their crop type maps and layers? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, so uh, one thing is like once we actually generate it per, uh, generate the data set per pixel, like, you know, whatever resolution that the satellite data is available at. So that's where we do the crop identification. Um, but once we have generated that, like now we are accumulating it at this uh, five kilometer by five kilometer grid, you know, but we could do it at lot level as well. Uh, we do have like plot detection algorithms like boundary detection. Uh, the only thing is we don't know if that, you know, sometimes that's evolving, right? Like the previous season, the farmer might actually grow in a larger area, but this time he might, he or she might decide to grow in a smaller area, in which case it's difficult to detect, uh, you know, like uh, what belongs to that particular farmer, right? So, but we only detect where crops are growing. So we, we can actually accumulate that and actually draw boundaries and look at that. Uh, so that's really possible. So we have done it for other regions. We have not done it for Nigeria, but we have done it in Bangladesh. Um, also, I'm aware that mixed cropping, mixed cropping is indeed is a challenge. One way to look at mixed cropping is like, uh, these are crop specific signatures. We are not looking at uh, spectral and spatial alone. It's also in the temporal region some of the signatures tend to disassociate themselves in the temporal also, right? Uh, but it's still, if there are crops which are very, very similar in signature, it becomes difficult to then separate them. I think that's an open problem. Then we probably have to rely on, uh, in the future, some new missions which come like, where we have like high spatial resolutions, and then we can actually probably try to dissociate, disassociate them. 
Um, when there is disaster like flooding, I yeah, I mean, when there is flooding, we can detect flooding. We can also have these extreme events, right? Like which has happened. We can give like uh, warnings, uh, early warnings. But even after that has happened, uh, post event also, you could do an analysis, right? Like you, you could do a pre flooding and post uh, flooding, um, you know, related how much of crop loss um, and everything is. Uh, uh, is happening because of these extreme events, right? Um, uh, so that's uh, the thing. Um, we do, as regarding open uh, source, we do try to, as much as possible, uh, try to share some of these knowledge and everything. We uh, Unfortunately, we can't share some of this data because it's uh, it belongs to certain farmers. We are trying to see how to an anonymize them and then share it. I think there's a lot of discussions happening on anonymizing of uh, geospatial data, you know, like uh, last week, even we had a meetup on that. So, um, but please do connect with me separately on this and we'll be happy to uh, also share. Um, what size images are pro processed and is the image data augmented with any time stamped data? Um, so the image, so the, yeah, the sizes, as I said, is dependent on the spatial resolution. So uh, we can look at either at uh, the pixel level of or we look at the minimum that we can actually look at if you look if you're talking about sizes of the farm the minimum that we can actually what we process try to process is one hectare below that it becomes really difficult right like so <clears throat> that's a one um, one drawback of the current medium resolution satellites you know um is it uh, th yeah some of these are timestamp data because we do have like exact information you know, when we collect ground truth, we actually collect also when is the sowing date, when is the harvest date, any intermediate, uh, you know, uh, any intermediate uh, management practices which are also followed, they are also like, you know, uh, noted. And anyway, satellite data is timestamp, right? So that's not an issue. I think maybe the question is more on ground truth data. What compute power is needed and how long does it take to train a model? So uh, we have been very careful about that, like uh, because when you're large, when you're doing a large inference, I think it's uh, important to also take that into account. Uh, so some of uh, you know, our, our, you know, while we uh, do train a model, so we have made it now efficient, much more efficient, and so within a few hours we are able to train a model. So we don't need actually like GPU, only like large memory machines are needed for training. Um, and if you're, uh, so these are deep learning models, it actually takes a few hours, but if you're just running like simple, like uh, uh, pixel based models, like classical models, then it doesn't actually take too much time. Uh, you know, in fact, it's like less than an hour, you can actually get some uh, good results, right? Um, I mean, I'm not talking about parameter tuning and everything. I think parameter tuning itself is like probably could, uh, you know, for, uh, for uh, some of these pixel level models, it could actually take a longer period of time than just uh, an hour. Thanks for the presentation. Could you please let us know identification of direct seed rice and transplanted rice uh, uh, separation methods? You know, uh, that is indeed one of the challenging problem. Uh, so the way to look at it is like to look at from optical data and like try to identify, combine both optical and radar data. So in radar data, you can clearly like uh, find out like what is a transplanted rice uh, and use maybe like optical data to generally find what's the rice plantation, like what, what's the rice acreages. The difference between both of them would give you the direct seeded rice. So uh, uh, I'm a PhD scholar working in AI and agriculture. Could you please explain which state in South India is more vulnerable to climate change in terms of horticultural production? Also, which states has adopted the AI-based technologies, which is more feasible for me to collect primary data. Um, so it's a difficult problem. I think like what we have looked at is uh, in tomato, for example, uh, in fact, like uh, we did see that uh, it was getting severely affected. Some of the fruit crops, for example, I personally have noticed that I'm uh, actually, I have my farm in South India. Last year, <clears throat> I had huge loss in mango, for example, in my farm. Uh, because of loss and we, we, I couldn't actually have them pollinated because the uh, flowering flowers themselves, they drop um, because of high heat and because the bees, you know, which are pollinators couldn't actually pollinate them in time. 
So I I don't have exact answers to it, which could be, I think most of India is uh, affected. Uh, that's what we actually saw, uh, especially some of the more agrarian uh, states are, you know, very severely affected, you know, so, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, what is a, which state has adopted. So there is a, you know, like uh, all, almost all the states now has a mandate to provide uh, advisories to farmers. So uh, it has actually started from the central government and now the training has been actually passed on to almost all the states uh, that, you know, I know of. And this year, in fact, all the states have actually started and they have, they have actually been given a framework on implementation. So this is for providing crop insurance to farmers. So any uh, you know regional uh, remote sensing um, you know center if you contact uh, they will actually be able to provide you with more information um, are there any secondary data sources available for studying the impact of ai uh, studying the impact of ai in agriculture in india um, i can actually like maybe um, <clears throat> uh, take this question later on offline so if you can write to me i can share those data sources as well uh, or one question from Subit. Uh, uh, do you use any ISRO satellite for analysis? If so which ones do you recommend? Uh, we have not yet started, unfortunately. Uh, this year, I think uh, ISRO has opened some of the data set for high resolution, especially. And uh, we, some of these pipelines have been built earlier. Uh, so I hope and maybe in the next webinar or the next presentation, I'll be very happy and proud to share some of the results from these high resolution uh, you know, data from ISRO. Um, any suggestions for sustainable practice identification such as tillage assessment using satellite data? Yes, in fact, like, you know, you, uh, we have done some analysis for potato growers where we did uh, to see whether there is, uh, you know, like low tilling versus no tilling versus heavy tilling. Uh, so there are uh, certain uh, indices. I think it's, you can probably look at, uh, normalized difference tillage index. I think that's a good place to start. Um, and then you can actually like group them and cluster them. So if you know some farms where actually uh, tillage is being done or not being done, I think that's a good place to actually start uh, and see how um, you know NDTI or other indices could be actually used. So the basic idea is that when the tillage happens, when there's any disturbance happens, like, you know, um, kind of the, um, uh, that disturbance, uh, uh, you know, can be actually be captured. And, uh, you know, there is probably like, you know, like when, when as against, you know, like, for example, grasslands and things that where, you know, like it's almost goes undisturbed. So when there is any human activity, I think like, you know, the, 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 it's, it has a very specific signature in that in some of the spectral bands. And I think that could be used. It's not completely like, you know, fail safe. Uh, there could be areas where, minimum tilling or medium tilling happens. And uh, it's of course difficult to detect. Maybe high resolution satellites could also be, a, you know, could bring a difference there, you know, in the future, so. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Be. I think these are most of, let me say, closely all the questions you've answered. Thanks a lot for this, Praveen. But may I also ask one question then? <laughs> yes, sure. I have also one question. And so I was wondering, because you were saying there people are transforming, right, from a certain area where a strong drought is ongoing and then they're going, moving to other region and opening up new agricultural fields. I was wondering, because you were mentioning maize and rice, which are very strongly, has a strong need on water, why don't they change to plants or crops which needs less water? So would this not, not also be um, a solution? I'm, I'm just wondering why they don't change the crop types let me say instead of moving really somewhere else do you yes. know the well, reason that, you know that's a great question in fact like i mean uh, so some of these are like actually staple uh, food crops so it's also is like you know part of their uh, you know food culture and everything but there are uh, you know some studies uh, which we plan to do for example on millets you know like millets are uh, minimal water consum consuming so, uh, so we we want to study the, for example, extend this study also to such kind of climate resilient crops like millets. Uh, so that's the next phase of our work also. Um, but it's true that uh, and a lot of the of the 
farmer behavior has got to do with uh, not only like you know uh, but also availability of inputs you know so not many of these climate resilient crop uh, seeds might be available for farmers uh, so sometimes what farmers do is uh, they actually have the previous crops a little bit of seeds they save them and they use it for this particular season you know and then when eventually when they actually like run out of those seeds then they look at maybe loans and other things you know and this is what we have noticed in the indian subcontinent you know um, but you know there is more push from the government also to adopt for example in india definitely like millets has become like now mainstream earlier it was like uh, sidelined and now it's actually mainstream in fact um, you know this season i also planted both rice and millet just to try you know uh, but the uh, you know it's coming back i, I feel and i think more and more farmers are looking at those kind of climate resilient crops as well so it depends okay. on the availability of inputs you know like seed inputs mm -hmm. what is available in the local market you know so uh, that's also yeah, this could be a good reason i agree mm -hmm. yeah. okay yeah. yeah thanks a lot again you see you had a lot of interest a lot of uh, questions and thanks for answering all of them i like also to thank the audience for for being so dynamic and asking us a question i think that's actually how it should be so we would like to receive a lot of questions to our speakers and uh, yeah, we hope that we see you again back <laughs> for our next webinars, uh, which will be then always announced. So if you go again, so I think Rabia was already uh, posting the, um, the line where you can um, in principle connect to react. So where you where we then also post other webinars and other activities uh, that we are doing within react so that you can be informed. Okay, so then I'd like to close now the session. Thanks again to everybody, the speaker especially, and also to the audience. Thanks a lot and uh, have still a nice evening or a nice morning or a nice day. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Bye.